Heresies, my beloved true seekers. Welcome so much to Aeon Bite, formerly known as Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis, and formerly broadcast through the now defunct FreeThoughtMedia.com. This is your eternal exploration of that dream of you, beyond the dream of the Red King and the nightmares of Kuthalu, in the shape of understanding Gnosticism, the Gnostics, and Gnosis. We shy away from scholarly pontification and definitely try and shy away from New Edge babble. We don't take prisoners here at the Virtual Alexandria but liberate them. You and I, we have a higher calling. So make sure you've politically incorrectly got some fuel in your cup and some tobacco substance to burn. Because as always, coffee is for closers and we're gonna burn one way or another. Either under the wrath of the black hole sun of the Demiurge, or the astral fire of the alchemists of ancient Kemet, or Egypt in the common tongue. We walk through a barbed labyrinth called existence, following that golden cord that is our forgotten childlike selves, avoiding the minotaurs of madness. We sail through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy and whatever feather-brained imagery I can think of. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. Lose your mind and come to your senses in this eternal champion's epic towards the farthest shores of imagination. Buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the famous Colombian author, once wrote that God's mistake, his first of many mind farts, was resting on the seventh day. Six wasn't enough to build a universe that would eventually have more problems than Windows Vista. So while he basked in his glory, drank piña coladas and was caught in the rain, the old man missed abundant details on that seventh day that left a kink universe of violent action and reaction, from the creation of stars to the nature of man. He led a universe of kitty porn, cancer, natural disaster, viruses, Bob Saget, and an underlying anxiety and greed sewn into the souls of all sentient beings. And the Creator God was ignorant of this, and that ignorance has been the true waterboarding original sin that is our ethereal Guantanamo Bay. Your suffering will be legendary even in hell. And thus God's higher hypostasis, the nature of him that requires no desire for creation, had to set a plan in motion to finish that seventh day in the form of apostles of lights and their messages that are but holy memes, sacrosanct plasmids that will connect all the astral dots and fill the gaps. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. And in some way or another, we, the Gnostics and the lovers of the Esoterica, are part of this plan, each with our own paths and destinies and dooms, that will mend the holy net Indra is known to cast over the multiverse in times of great darkness. In legend, that looks like a shimmering spider web where everything is reflected equally on each dewy strand and reveals that all is one and one is all. But what does that mean, Buddha? Like the Gospel of Philip says, the world came about through a mistake, for he who created it wanted to create it imperishable and immortal. He fell short of attaining his desire, for the world never was imperishable, nor, for that matter, was he who made the world. For things are not imperishable, but suns are. Nothing will be able to receive imperishability if it does not first become a sun. But he who has not the ability to receive, 
how much more will he be unable to give? If you don't mind my saying so, this conversation is getting a little strange. And in this eternal now, or approximately Saturday, May 2nd, the year of our Demiurge 2009, with your host Abraxas, we take a look at the situation in a microcosmic way by touring a Gnostic gospel that took the shape of a television show that to this day mesmerizes and stimulates so many people around the world. And that is the cult program called The Prisoner which I'm sure most of you have heard of or have had the chance to be blown away by it. If you've heard the term, I'm not a number, I'm a human being, then you know the source of this powerful clarion call uttered 40 years ago. We all scream silently to the Matrix in our daily travails. It's hard to find the moral high ground when we're all standing in the mud. Remember, a Gnostic scripture in our postmodern world doesn't have to take the form of a scroll or codex. Gnosis is a virus of living information that breaks through the incompleteness of what happened on that seventh day when God and his angels took their self-given, infernal union-mandated break. I am the supreme being. I'm not entirely dim. I should mention that in Islam, Muhammad corrected this myth. He simply had in the Quran God stand and watch his galactic factory with satisfaction. I guess Allah forgot to put on his contact lenses on that day because it still comes down to the same cosmic enchilada. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. I doubt Gabriel Garcia Marquez read any of the Nag Hammadi library. But such mythopoems as The Secret Book of John, The Origins of the World, and The Nature of the Rulers verify that creation was more of a housing project goal than a Las Vegas casino. We are God's unwanted children, so be it! Our astral guest is Valerie Ziegler, author of Julia, The Public Romance and Private Agony of Julia Ward Howe, and Chair of Religious Studies at DePaul University. Beyond her expertise in Gnosticism and comparative religion in general, Valerie actually teaches a complete course on The Prisoner and how it relates to Gnostic geophysics and other occult themes. I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. If you've had the beatitude of watching the surreal, existential British show The Prisoner, then its Gnostic undertones will come as no surprise. If you haven't watched it or only heard about it, then you're missing out on one of the most important Gnostic treatises of our modern era. Although on the outside it may seem like uh, one of the many spy shows that were the rage in the 60s, and of course Mike Myers parodied in his Austin Power series, The Prisoner is actually a husky allegory that not only parallels several Gnostic scriptures, which Valerie will go into in our interview, but deals with the same issues the ancient heretics muse in their visions and theologies. What is true and false reality? What are the means to return to the beginning to escape or perhaps repair the false reality and its countless lullaby systems? When the long night comes, return to the end of the beginning. What does it mean to be a true individual instead of part of the collective once one has drank from the bubbling springs of self-knowledge? How does one go about uniting interior and exterior dualities in order to find salvific knowledge? When did it all go wrong and how do we heal while helping others out of the bugbear fantasies of spiritual amnesia? And several other themes that creator Patrick McGowan purposely wanted to tackle in the creation of his Evangelion and many other artists have emulated also purposely for the last 40 years as again you will see in our interview with Valerie. It's all part of the plan. We have dealt with Gnostic Gospels in the medium of film on programs number 12 and 50. Check them out and check out of mundane reality for a moment to spell. Unfortunately, as discussed with Valerie, television is still, well, sigh, the vast wasteland. For the most part, it is formulaic, predictable, 
and infected with pack mentality creativity. The peak of your civilization. Not that film doesn't suffer from this as well, but there are more visionary risk takers in celluloid. So in essence, finding true esoteric messages in television is like finding your brush when you're running late for work. Some of the bright pulsars are perhaps found in long-running series, usually speculative fiction, in which different themes can be toyed with. An example is the series Stargate, towards the end in the ninth season, with the introduction of the Ori, a race of ascended beings that deceive and oppress humanity for the purpose of deriving energy from mankind to fuel their level of ascension. They're in my hair, on my skin, they're all over the place. Another example would be in Doctor Who, specifically in the episodes The Parting of Ways and The Long Game, which draws on heavy Gnostic themes. Many listeners have written to me claiming the series Lost has Gnostic illusions, although many have written saying it doesn't. We do know that a copy of Philip K. Dick's Valis does appear in one episode. Personally, I'm still neutral on this television program. Don't ever tell me what I can't do, ever! This is destiny. This is destiny. This is, this is my destiny. This is, I'm supposed to do this, damn it! Don't tell me what I can't do! My good friend Errol recommends two shows, Meadowlands, which in the UK is called Cape Wrath, and Wonderfalls. He calls them old hairy Gnostic tales, and my boy is rarely wrong about such matters. There can be a case for the recent remake of Battlestar Galactica. After all, beyond its ultra-violence and noir elements in a sci-fi package, Battlestar Galactica also deals with the themes of what is reality, what is it to be conscious, and the eternal Gnostic theme of where is the true home beyond so many layers of Archons and their counterfeit heavens. The villains, the Cylons, seem to believe in this demiurgic god that not only wants to destroy humanity, but also enslave much of it for no other reason than to amuse himself with their suffering and keep and understand something he or the Cylons don't have, the human spirit. And like the prisoner, Battlestar Galactica chronically becomes surreal, metaphorical, and a quest not only to salvation, but a journey back into what went wrong. We also find Archon and Aeon-like fallen beings who are just as unconscious as both Cylon and human, who have been pulling many strings without even knowing it. So the fate of the entire human race depends upon my wild guess. Towards the end, we discover the identities of a Sophia and Logos archetype that don't truly thwart the demiurgic god, but actually manipulate him in the hope of uniting the collective, mechanical Cylons and the imperfect, individualistic humans. I can't help thinking somewhere in the universe there has to be something better than man. A case can also be made for the shows Life on Mars, The Dollhouse, and perhaps Twin Peaks, but a case can be made against them as well. Again, television is just television, and saying Simon Cowell as the Demiurge just isn't going to cut it. But one form where Gnostic themes prevail is in the arena of anime. Although many anime presentations originally came out in movie form here in the West, we get to enjoy them on Adult Swim or Wayward Cable channels. The Japanese animators are experts at mixing myths, genres, theologies, and philosophies, and often hit the Gnostic pay dirt. The old animated series Aeon Flux, and I'm sure the title is no accident, is a perfect example. Gnostic themes are also prevalent in such shows as Full Metal Alchemist, Sol Bianca, Revolutionary Girl Athena, Last Exile, and one of my favorite all-time anime series, Evangelion Neon Genesis. I'm waiting to be impressed. But alas, there isn't much more out there. Perhaps I'm missing some others. If you know of them, let this forgotten deity in on it. On a rather baffling side note, there is an episode of the old vanilla show Gilmore Girls called Nag Hammadi. It's where they found the Gnostic Gospels. 
Although the show itself doesn't even deal with what the title claims. Look, but don't touch. But the prisoner certainly is a four square Gnostic gospel that has gripped the imagination of people for decades. Valerie demonstrates this in our interview why you don't have to listen to any more of my drivel, my beloved true seekers. Let us continue our revolution by adding an eighth day. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us today we have Valerie Ziegler to talk about uh, the Gnosticism of the Prisoner and other television shows. How are you doing today, Valerie? I'm uh, doing great. How about you, Miguel? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for uh, joining the show and uh, giving us some of your time. Well, thanks for asking me. Uh, pleasure's all mine. So tell us, Valerie. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us a short history or a synopsis of uh, The Prisoner, including how the show came about and how you became uh, so interested in the show that you actually teach it at your university? Yeah, I think I can. The show starred Patrick McGowan, uh, and it aired in 1967 and 1968 in Great Britain, uh, and then showed in the United States in the summer of 1968 actually as a replacement for the Jackie Gleason show, uh, if anybody can remember back that far to the Jackie Gleason show. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but McGowan had starred earlier uh, in a television series that in the States was called Secret Agent uh, and in Britain was called Danger Man. And uh, most viewers, I think, would be familiar with the theme from Secret Agent, or at least the one that was played in the States, which was Secret Agent Man. You know, the da 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 There's a man right, the right, one. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that one, yeah. He had made, oh, about 90 episodes of Danger Man and was tired of it, essentially. But uh, Danger Man was a huge hit in Britain and also outside of Britain. And his network was very interested in keeping him working. And so he had an idea for a different show, and he pitched it to them, and they bought it, uh, and that became The Prisoner. Um, so they started filming, oh gosh, for The Prisoner, I guess it would have been uh, probably in fall of 1966. And uh, the show was very, very unusual. Uh, and actually got sort of stranger as it went along. It became more and more allegorical. But at least at the beginning, it seemed to pick up on uh, the secret agent mania that was sort of uh, marking Western television. You know, again, if you can think back, people were watching Man from Uncle. They were watching I Spy, uh, all that, that stuff. The premise of The Prisoner is that this unknown man, where we never learn his name, we see him driving around London, uh, entering an underground car park, coming out, striding angrily down a dark corridor, and then entering an office and resigning his position. And then we see him back in the car, uh, driving back to his London apartment, and beginning to pack, apparently for a trip. And uh, while he's packing, a hearse drives up, and the undertaker gets out and essentially uh, gasses him, sends gas in through uh, the keyhole uh, of his apartment door. And when he wakes up, he is in an exact replica of his apartment. So he thinks he's at home until he looks outside the window. And outside the window, he sees just a, a bizarre uh, landscape. Uh, and so he has no idea where he is. And at, basically, as the pilot develops, he has been kidnapped. He doesn't know by whom. And he's been taken to a place that is known only as the village. Uh, no one has names there. They only have numbers. They all have uniforms to wear. And what they want to know from him is, why did he resign? Essentially, they want to know his secrets. And again, we're never really told what his job was, although it certainly looks like he's some kind of government agent. And the rest of the series essentially is uh, the head bureaucrat in the village, who's named number two, uh, is trying to crack the prisoner, whose number is number six. And the prisoner doesn't want to crack, obviously. He doesn't want to give away information. He 
would like to learn who's running the village. He'd really like to learn who number one is. Uh, and, of course, everybody who watched the show wanted to know who number one is as well. And he wants to escape. And I, that's basically the premise. But even describing the premise, you don't really get the surreal nature uh, of the show. It was filmed on a secret location. They didn't tell anybody where it was filmed until the last episode. Uh, and the film site was this place in Wales called Port Marion, which is a resort village that was put together by an eccentric Welsh architect who he collected buildings, or he would even collect facades of buildings. And so this place is just, it's very, very strange. Uh, it, it's this mishmash of architecture. Some buildings are real. Some are only facades. I mean, it just it just looks surreal. It could be anywhere. It could be nowhere. And the people are dressed very strangely. Uh, they either are wearing blazers with piping or else they wear these uh, brightly colored capes. And uh, it's just, he, he never, ever, you know, really knows who runs it. He doesn't know who the other prisoners are and who the warders are. Uh, and increasingly, as the show goes on, it becomes quite clear that in addition to sort of being a spy genre kind of television show, it's also an existentialist show. I mean, it's asking questions about what does it mean to be an individual? What does it mean to live in society? What does it mean to have an identity? And what does it mean to be free? Or even, is it possible to be free? Uh, and it becomes clear that the village isn't just a place. It's obviously an existential condition as well. And more than that, it may actually be just a mirror of what our world is, uh, just shown slightly uh, more surreally. Does that sort of get at it? Yes, very <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it was bewildering to people and absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, people didn't quite know what to do with it. Right. And was, do you think it was meant to be a uh, just a temporal series, or do we know? <laughs> oh, yes, we know. I mean, uh, The Prisoner is a, has a very, very, very loyal fan base, even 40-plus years afterwards. People know about as much as it's possible to know about the production history of The Prisoner. Uh, and basically, uh, McGowan, you know, he was the star. He was also the executive producer. He also wrote four or five of the episodes, uh, and he directed several of them as well. So as much as one television show can be, you know, sort of the product of a single person, I mean, that's never truly possible, but The Prisoner is more like that uh, than virtually any show you can think of. Uh, his vision for the show was always more allegorical, metaphorical, more surreal, less of a just, you know, another spy genre kind of, of thing. Whereas uh, the main script editor, editor, a guy named George Mark Stein, very much wanted the show to be an interesting spy show, but a, a fairly normal spy show, just with this twist that you don't know where the village is and you don't know his name and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and they sort of battled it out, uh, and in the end, uh, Mark Stein left the series, and McGowan was left in charge, and uh, the show became increasingly, as I said, allegorical. Never really answered most of the questions that it raised, but uh, that's why I think people loved it so much. Uh, it did have a final episode, uh, and so things were settled. <laughs> except that uh, it was a very, very, very strange ending. People had a very difficult time uh, interpreting it, uh, so that uh, millions of people watched that, that final ending. The Prisoner was really the first series to actually have an ending. And uh, afterwards, people were so upset that it wasn't clear that McGowan actually left the country for a while, uh, the network sent out sort of a cheat sheet telling people what all the symbols meant so that they could figure it out for themselves. And uh, it became a legend. I mean, it, it was a legend almost instantly just from sort of the surreal nature uh, and the intriguing quality. I mean, you know, people really wanted to know who number one was, uh, and they, they wanted to know who ran the village, and 
they wanted to know, you know, what would have to happen for there to be a happy ending to this show. And there is an ending, but it isn't a happy ending, and it doesn't answer all the questions. And, again, that's what uh, prisoner fans uh, love to discuss, and I think it's definitely one of the reasons that the show has lived for so long. Yeah, it's kind of like people discussing the ending of The Sopranos. You'll be hearing yeah. about that for the next 10, yeah, 20 years. Yeah, exactly. Like that. But, yeah. Valerie, um, mm-hmm. how did you connect the dots in uh, seeing the Gnosticism of the prisoner? When, well, was your, uh, when, when was your moment of gnosis <laughs> to the prisoner, if you, would, if you could call that? Um, a couple episodes really got me thinking about it. And once I got into it, I just I saw Gnostic themes everywhere. Uh, but one of the first of the episodes is called Dance of the Dead. And basically the plot is that a dead body washes up on shore in the village and the prisoner finds it and plans to send it back to sea with his picture and story in the guy's wallet, hoping that the body will be found and that he might be rescued. That, of course, doesn't happen. Uh, But the number, the person who's the number two in this episode really pushes the prisoner hard uh, to accept the fact that to the outside world, he is dead, uh, that no one's looking for him, And in fact, uh, as far as they're concerned, he's dead. He has no life other than the life that he has in the village. And she tells him that if he insists upon living a dream, people will think that he's mad. And he answers, well, I like my dream. Uh, And that episode uh, just got me thinking about the Hymn of the Pearl, uh, you know, where uh, the the Gnostic hymn where... Right, the boy uh, begins sort of in a a heavenly kingdom and then uh, is sent by his parents below. And once he gets below, he has to put on the clothing and eat the food of uh, the people who are down below. And he forgets his identity. He uh, forgets his mission to find the pearl. And he is lost uh, and remains lost until his parents send him uh, a, a letter that reminds him of his identity, and then he's able to return and reunite with the clothing and the people that he's left behind, and he becomes himself again uh, and one again. And I just thought the, the the conversation between number six and number two about you know what's real, what isn't real, what's a dream, what's madness, uh, that conversation just reminded me very much of the kind of conversation any person any religious person might have, you know, who claims that there's another reality that you can't see here or touch here or connect to here, but yet exists and is more real and better than what what the present reality is. And so I just sort of um, filed that away. Uh, And then there's another episode called Many Happy Returns in uh, which... The prisoner escapes, builds a raft, and is able to make it back to London. And one of the questions that students always ask about this episode is, why does he go back to London? Uh, That's where he's from. He goes back to his job. But by now, we've seen enough of the series to know that whoever runs the village, his agency that he worked for is definitely involved in the village so that he knows if he goes back to London, he's going back to the very people who had him kidnapped in the first place. So for students, the obvious plot question is, well, why does he keep going back there? In fact, every time he escapes, he goes back there. And there really isn't a good answer to that. Uh, You know, if this is just a spy series and the whole point is that he wants to escape, then it is stupid to go back to London. But... If you think about sort of the images that are there, he always returns to his apartment. He always returns to his car. He's got this fancy Lotus 7 sports car. He always gets to dump his village uniform and put his own clothes on. Basically, he's going back to the life that is, as far as he's concerned, his real life. Yeah, that's kind of like uh, yeah, Lake, exactly. Lakes Albion or The Prince, The Land of the East. Right, basically. Uh, or like the Gospel of Thomas, you know, you have to return to the beginning. 
uh, to uh, the seventh day of the creation uh, when all is perfect uh, before things have been split apart and pulled apart. Uh, the only way to find salvation is to return to the beginning. And so if you look at, again, the metaphor there, that makes a lot of sense. And McGowan was very clear that the series was allegorical. Uh, as an allegory, that makes tons of sense. There's no place else to go except back to the beginning. Uh, if you read it through the Gospel of Thomas or the, the Hymn of the Pearl, uh, it makes perfect Gnostic sense, even if it doesn't make perfect uh, spy sense. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. And uh, for the listener, we might be giving some spoilers here. Oh, yeah. Uh, tell so, me uh, uh, how much you don't want me to tell. No, no, no. I'll just have the listeners will just have to fast forward <laughs> if, they <don't, laughs> if they don't want to listen to this. But okay. uh, the fascinating thing is, uh, well, A, the series ends like it begins, right? Yes. That's it. That's, uh, that's it. He, yes. ret- he returns home. He returns home, and the first shot, typically, of an episode is uh, you see the sky, and there's loud thunder, and then the camera opens up on this long, long road, and way at the far end of the road, you see this car coming at you at at an incredible speed, and when it's close enough, you see that it's uh, the prisoner driving his Lotus 7. And uh, then you go into the rest of the pre-credit sequence where he does his resignation and everything. Yes, so the final scene of the final episode is he's back at his flat, in his car, out driving again, and they showed the exact same opening scene as the ending scene. So he's back, but he's not done. There's really no closure there. And the other thing, too, is uh, the fascinating, obviously, in a, in a Gnostic mythos, yeah. or even in a more, probably more in the postmodern Gnostic mythos, of, you know, let's say Philip K. Dick or something like mm-hmm. that. Number one, who is in charge of the village, who is he really? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like I said, people were just dying to know. And you don't find out till probably the last 10 minutes. <laughs> of the final episode, uh, and it's it's very strange. But basically, number one is first unmasked as a gibbering ape, uh, and then the ape mask is pulled off. Number six pulls the ape mask off and looks into the face of number one and finds that it is his own face, uh, and that number one represents the bestial side of him. And so they they have a big screaming match at each other, and uh, number six chases, this could only happen on TV, right? Number six <laughs> chases number one up into a rocket and then blasts him out into space. Uh, you know how that happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. You just have that rocket around and oh, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the 60s, they could do that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, I, McGowan was Catholic, and I suspect that he probably unconsciously was playing around with notions of original sin and unmasking number one as himself, essentially. Fans thought it was really strange, as you can imagine, because they expected to see, you know, some kind of Bond supervillain, like, I don't know, Dr. No or something. Uh, And instead, I mean, McGowan explained later that you know, it's sort of hard to think about who the number most evil thing in the world is, and by now everyone expects that that is what number one's going to be. And his answer was, well, the most evil thing in the world is that part of ourselves that is evil, uh, that we fight daily uh, and try to, in some ways, come to terms with or at least to tame. So yeah, fans were... Uh, very confused, and many of them highly disappointed with that as an ending. Um, but again, from a Gnostic viewpoint, that ending actually makes a lot of sense. Number six, basically, like in the Gospel of Thomas or in the Gospel of Philip, has to find a way to make the two one. He has to find a way to become an integrated soul. Well, uh, which, of course, would be the challenge for any Gnostic on Earth, right? Uh, right? To come to know who you truly are 
and then to be able to claim and live that identity so that you're no longer two, who you truly are out there and who you are down here, but the two have become one. Uh, and by blasting number one out into space, there, the two-ness is gone and uh, number six is integrated again and can go back to the beginning. I guess number one could be seen as the demiurge slash Jung's ego, and even in the Valentinian myths, mm-hmm. the demiurge does rise up to the Pleroma once he's uh, mm-hmm. once mm-hmm. he's been saved. So, uh, and I assume, uh, what what is your opinion on uh, what was the name of the ball that oh, used Rover? to give me? He used to give me nightmares as a child. I, I know, God, I, I know. To, uh, be afraid he would come into my room as a child. I guess he would be an archon. What? What, what, what was he? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, I mean, my memories of Rover are exactly the same as yours. And everyone who has ever seen an episode of The Prisoner remembers Rover. Yeah, Rover's terrifying. Yeah, they never you never know if it's a sentient being or not. Uh, but the history of production is sort of funny. I, Rover was intended to be a machine uh, that could go up walls and also float on the water. But when they tried it out on location, it couldn't do anything. I mean, it was just a a horrible failure. So they had to invent Rover uh, while they were in Wales filming at Port Marion on location. And uh, there was uh, a weather balloon in the air that people were looking at. It turned out there was a station near there. And basically, uh, Rover was just uh, sort of a moment of inspiration. But, I mean, it's way scarier than any machine uh, could ever have been uh, because it looks real. I mean, it looks alive. Yeah, it kills people essentially by smothering and possibly ingesting them. Uh, and, it, yeah, it can chase you anywhere, born under the sea and comes to the surface and uh, yeah, it, it can it can go on air, it can go on land, it can go on water, uh, and it's it's really really terrifying. To be honest, I don't I'm not quite sure what rover is. I mean, people have suggested you know a lot of different ways of looking at it, uh, but it's scary. That's the one thing everybody remembers if they've seen the prisoner. Is I mean, it's just terrifying. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you think rover is? Obviously, an archon trying to keep people in the land of the dead. Uh, yeah, Ooh. maybe the mm-hmm. you know Kabbalah concept of the Kel- no no purpose uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> that we'll ever find out. I don't know, but uh, yeah, no maybe, purpose but destruction. Exactly, exactly. That part of the the cosmos that just exists to destroy. That's, mm-hmm. that's the best mm-hmm. I can come up with. Yeah, so. oh, it's funny there. I have read one piece of fan fiction. The students don't like this at all, but it's a, it's a funny short story. Uh, it's written from Rover's point of view. <laughs> and, yeah, in this version, Rover is like an extraterrestrial who has been captured <laughs> and forced, essentially, to function as the police officer uh, of the village and it, it's actually quite painful for him to be on earth and he feels really bad for number six but they're both slaves so oh, yeah, that's a good take one. that one for what it's worth <laughs> yeah i kind of like the story that puts uh grendel's point of view you know? yeah you get the monster's point of view on that's things. right yeah or like wicked where you get uh, the the witch's point of view right. yeah wizard of oz and uh, any other Gnostic, blatant Gnostic themes that you see in some of the episodes? No, I think those are uh, the most prominent. But once you start looking for going back to the beginning or making the two one, uh, they, they just work on all kinds of levels. Uh, number six is a hero, but he is not a hero without flaws. I mean, he has his own sort of Machiavellian tendencies. And, I mean, he has resigned from a job that clearly involved dirty secrets uh, and his hands can't possibly be clean. Uh, So even though he doesn't like being a prisoner and he doesn't like uh, the kinds of interrogation that he's subject to, and no one would, on the flip side, he's been involved in those kinds of things himself. Uh, So there's a sense in which... 
he's got to figure out who he is, and that's part of what this series is about. You know, there's a sense in which he belongs to the world of light uh, and freedom, but there's another sense in which he really belongs to the world of the dead. You know, his place of work is underground. His own clothing is all black. Uh, again, I mean, suggesting, you know, uh, a connection to death. And uh, as much as he hates what's being done to him in the village, he's been part of a system that does that kind of inhuman thing to others. So, you know, I mean, it's really interesting about what it would mean for the two there to become one. It sort of, in some ways, parallels what's happening with number one and number six. There's no way to get that light and the darkness together. Uh, instead, he's going to have to pick one or the other. Uh, and ultimately, he chooses light uh, rather than darkness. And so the two become one uh, in that way. But yeah, once you start watching for that, uh, it's really everywhere in the series. And it, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a great series in any case. But if you're interested in Gnosticism, I mean, it's, it's exceptionally fun uh, and, and very fruitful. And Valerie, what other... Uh television shows in your opinion do you think have gnostic elements Miguel, i have to say i don't watch that much tv i think to have a much of an opinion about this uh i i, I knew that you were probably going to ask me that yeah. uh, <laughs> and it's like uh-oh <laughs> i mean i the one that comes to mind most readily uh would be life on mars you know that show? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I heard mean, that too. Yes, I have. Yeah. It was a really successful uh, as a British series and is currently, I think, going through a one year and done uh, on ABC. Uh, and I, I don't think the American version is as good uh, as the British version, but I mean, the British series was just exceptional. Uh, and basically the plot is uh, there's this police officer, Sam Tyler, who is hit by a car and he's hurt severely, and he wakes up in 1973. He's who he is, but everybody's back in time, and he's at his job, but of course it's, you know, 35 years earlier or whatever, and uh, he spends the whole show trying to come to grips with what's real, what isn't real, which of these worlds is the one that he really belongs in, what's happening to him. Is he going nuts? Has he really gone back in time? Is he in a coma? How can you, know, how can you even understand the self and your identity uh, in a situation like that? And ultimately, at the end, he does have the power to go back to uh, his original life, and he has to make a choice uh, between which, which world is the real world uh, and the world where he wants to spend the rest of whatever, you know, however long his experience as an individual lasts. So I, I think that has some Gnostic overtones, too. And even if you think it doesn't, it's a great series. So I, if you've got listeners out there who are looking for DVD stuff to buy, uh, <laughs> okay. Life on Mars, the British version, is awesome. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Uh, for some reason, television is still the vast uh, wasteland when it comes to really, you know, powerful, esoteric, religious themes, you know. It's just, yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And unlike people, movies, <laughs> which is uh, weird. Yeah, unlike movies, that people expect television to be very formulaic. Uh, and, of course, I mean, that's one of the reasons that The Prisoner stood out, and people either loved it because it didn't fit the formula or they didn't like it at all. But, yeah, it was ahead of its time in the 60s, and it's ahead of its time now. Uh, Valerie, you told me that you are also having your students watch uh, The Truman Show. Uh, yeah. what are, so what are some of the similarities between The Truman Show and The Prisoner? Oh, there's tons of similarities between The Truman Show and The Prisoner, and uh, many of them are there on purpose. Uh, Peter Weir was, on was a purpose. prisoner. On purpose, wow. Yeah, Peter Weir was a, a, a prisoner fan, uh, and it shows all over. I mean, basically, the plot is very similar. You know, The Truman Show is a television show about the life of this guy named Truman, but Truman doesn't know it's a show. He thinks it's reality. Uh, so uh, it was filmed in this uh, development called Sea Haven uh, in Florida, 
which is very village-like. I mean, it's almost sort of Disney-esque in its cuteness. Uh, everything is pastel. Everybody has, you know, a white picket fence, all that, that kind of stuff. Like the village, it's surrounded by water, and uh, Truman is unable to escape it. Uh, there are a lot of little touches that are that anybody that knows the prisoner will recognize. There are doppelgangers, for example, and that that's huge. Having, uh, you know, doubles of people is huge uh, in the prisoner, and they they do it on purpose in the Truman Show. They even oh, have, the prisoner had doppelgangers. Oh yeah, yeah, tons of them. Which, actually, that's another uh, interesting Gnostic tweak on it, too, if you think about it. Yeah, lots of people have doubles in the prisoner, and they never explain it. It's just, like, weird. You know, you see this guy, and then 30 seconds later, you see another person <laughs> looks just like him. So, yeah, they're working on that. Uh, the prisoner, basically, number two, has an office that has no windows, but it has a huge uh, television screen because everything's under surveillance in the village. And, of course, the prisoner is watched uh, continuously. And uh, the Truman Show has that same control room. Uh, it's run by the producer who's named Kristoff, uh, and he has the same huge screen where he can watch Truman. Uh, one of the uh, sort of touches of the prisoner was one of, its, one of the series symbols was a penny farthing, Viewer or listeners may not, they probably they will have seen a penny farthing, but they may not know that that's what they're called. It's one of those old bicycles where the front wheel is like huge, it's like five feet tall, uh, and yeah, the yeah. seat is way up, and then the back uh, wheel is very small. The penny farthing is everywhere uh, in the village, but there's always one parked in number two's office. Uh, and in the Truman Show, they don't have a penny farthing in the control room, but they have. Uh, a big Schwinn exercise bike that has one big front wheel. And, I mean, it's just like you could not be more blatant, you know, in trying to draw the connection to the prisoner. So uh, Christoph and the control room are essentially paralleled uh, by number two's control room and uh, the penny farthing. And the, the ends are not not dissimilar as well. I mean, for for both characters, the the drive is to find out, you know, who they really are, and to be able to claim that identity, and uh, to go to a place where they think that they will be freer. And that's pretty much how the Truman Show ends as well. Of course, Truman, if you remember the end, actually gets to walk on water, and Number Six never got to walk on water. Right. But but yeah, it's pretty similar. So there's there's a lot of connections, and and. Uh, they're not happenstance. Oh, uh, but yeah, one more I should say also. Uh, McGowan's uh, production company was called Everyman, uh, and the whole argument of the prisoner was, you know, this is the story of every person. So what you're seeing is life as we experience it as humans. You're watching number six, but he is representative of each of us. And, of course, the name Truman, True Man, those, those are the same kind of thing in the Truman Show. And uh, Valerie, what are some of your other uh, favorite Gnostic-themed films? Uh, perhaps are there others that have maybe borrowed from uh, The Prisoner? Oh, God, yeah, a lot of people have borrowed from The Prisoner. Okay, I'll tell you one that you probably weren't thinking of. I mean, this is an old film, and you may not even have seen it, but I mean, do you remember The Ghost and Mrs. Muir? No, it's never heard of it. <laughs> from the 30s or the 40s, I guess. Uh, well, it's the story of, I think Rex Harrison is the star. He's a Dead Sea captain. And uh, this woman named Mrs. Muir rents out his house. Uh, and he doesn't want anybody living in it, so he haunts it. And anyway, eventually they finally come to know one another and, of course, fall in love. Uh, but he can't stay because he's dead, and he has to go back to her world. So, uh, like the last 20, 25 minutes of the film, she just keeps walking out on the dock, like, looking for him. And, of course, she gets older and older, and then they're pushing her out in the wheelchair on the dock. And, I mean, it's quite clear that, you know, she's done with this world uh, and wants to be freed. 
to move on to the next. And so when she finally dies, uh, he reappears, and she's young again, and they go off together to the world that she now regards as the real world. That's sort of cool. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's how they intended it, but, yeah, when I'm explaining to students about Gnosticism uh, in my classes, I, sometimes I use that as an example. What other films do you like that have Gnostic themes? Well, okay, I I think I'm not a big film and Gnosticism person. I can't think of a lot of others. I, the work that I've done um, with Gnosticism professionally has primarily been uh, looking at uh, Genesis 1 to 3 in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And uh, what I was interested in was the way that uh, these stories construct gender. And I mean, it's possible to read Genesis 1 to 3 as two creation accounts that uh, subordinate women to men. But it's also possible to read them as two accounts that essentially regard men and women as equals. Uh, and so one of the things that I did, I just sort of did history of interpretation in the three traditions that have used Genesis, you know, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And uh, one of the richest places that uh, we discovered uh, gender equality in the reading of the, the creation stories in Genesis was, of course, uh, among the Gnostics. And even in Genesis, I've always thought that uh, Genesis, I believe Genesis 1, exactly. when it says created men and women, yeah. for some reason I always thought of Plato's hermaphrodite. You mm -hmm. know, it really, it's really one creature when you think about it. Or that's you can interpret it that way, right? Yes, you definitely can. You can actually, if, if listeners don't know, Genesis 1 tells the story of the six days of creation. And uh, people are the last things created. Uh, and they are made in the divine image, male and female. And it's, it's definitely possible to read male and female as, yeah, a hermaphrodite or an androgyne. It's also possible to read the same thing in Genesis 2. Uh, Genesis 2 is the story of the first thing created is the human being. Uh, it doesn't have a name. And then other stuff gets created. And then the last thing that's created is woman. And woman is taken out of this human being. And so once woman is taken out, then you can talk about now there's male and now there's female. Before there wasn't, but now there is. So I mean, there are long traditions both within Christianity and Judaism uh, of reading the original human being, even in Genesis 2, as a, a hermaphrodite or an androgyne. Uh, you don't have to read it that way, but the text supports that reading. I mean, it's the, the, fine uh, with the original Hebrew language, uh, and there are long traditions of reading it that way. So yeah, it's sort of funny. Most people don't know that about Genesis 2. Yeah, I mean, and like the Gospel of Thomas is just it's pretty awesome uh, in the way it talks about on the seventh day of creation, everything is perfect. And uh, that's why um, a seven-day-old child uh, is the one who is wise, because the one who dwells in the seventh day dwells in perfection. And there, there is no gender discrimination. Male and female both have dominion uh, over the creation and both share equally uh, in the divine image. That's that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. Well, the Gnostics did uh, kind of get sexist on the opposite side because in their creation myths, basically Adam is just some worm until yeah, yes. the divine feminine comes into him, right? Right, right. So they kind of they forgot about equality. In fact, they kind of stuck it to the man. <laughs> That's true. It, but, you know, as you know, I mean, there's a lot of scholarly debate about whether it even makes sense to talk about Gnosticism as a single entity. You know, because in a sense, it's, it's a kind of title that uh, was stuck on these groups uh, by people, by Christian theologians who were claiming to be orthodox or right-thinking. I mean, in some ways, it's just uh, another word for heretic. Uh, and so, 
you know, Gnosticism as we know it encompasses all kinds of different groups and very different kinds of literature. Uh, so, I mean, it, you know, it's not clear that all Gnostics would have thought that they were all Gnostics. You know, uh, they might not have recognized each other as belonging to the same thing in the way that we tend to think that they did. So that's actually a, a, a really interesting um, way that the field is moving. I mean, there are lots of debates about whether it even makes sense to talk about Gnosticism or not. I mean, I think it does, uh, but you sort of, you got to know who you're talking about. It's it's hard to to make generalizations of that, you know, that all Gnostics think this or all Gnostic stories are like that because uh, you're just talking about too many diverse groups and stories. Yeah, oh, believe me, Valerie, I've had many guests and uh, many viewpoints from many scholars mm -hmm. and uh, the debate will probably, until the debate will rage on, until <laughs> something else comes out of Egypt or something. Yeah, that's pops right, out. yeah. You know, be it's totally a, it's an cool. Open good. But uh, I think that's all the time we have today, uh, Valerie. I'd uh, like to thank you for coming on Aeon Byte and uh, giving us a very stimulating conversation on The Prisoner. Oh, well, thank you very much, Miguel. I mean, it's a real pleasure to think that people are interested in The Prisoner, because I think it's great. Uh, and uh, I'm out to uh, make fans any way I can, so thanks for giving me the chance. Oh, my pleasure, and uh, please stay away from Rover. <laughs> <laughs> you too. All right. Well, you Best have yourself a good day. Okay. Have a good day now. <laughs> you too. Bye bye.